Well, happy Easter, everybody. It is so good to be with you. And really, this is the most significant weekend in the Christian calendar. And, you know, I really am. We glad, we're, all, we're all glad you're in church in one of our services to reflect on what we consider Jesus, our Saviour, uh, and what he went through on the cross of Good Friday and then celebrate his resurrection on Sunday. Well, you know, this weekend, so significant for all of us. And I just want to encourage you on this weekend that as Jesus' death and resurrection, we also are people who go through pain and suffering and people who live in the new hope. It's interesting in the world that we live in today, on one hand, someone can be celebrating and someone else can be in pain and suffering. And the story of the Easter weekend, if you will, the story of Jesus' death uh, on Good Friday and his resurrection on Sunday is a story that I believe brings hope for all humanity. Ultimately, it's about us knowing and walking in relationship with our Heavenly Father. There's so much to un unpack in this story and it's my privilege to share with you this Easter message. The first thing I want to share with you today is the pain of Good Friday leads to the celebration of Resurrection Sunday. In other words, suffering comes before celebration. Now, this is true in many areas of life. It can be true uh, when I go to the gym that there's suffering before there's celebration. Uh, if you're studying, uh, there is suffering to get the degree or the qualification before there is the celebration of the achievement. If you're building any area of your life, a, a business, a career, often there's a whole lot of suffering before there's celebration. Well, this is really, really true when it comes to the story of Easter and the story of Jesus. See, Jesus knew that he would have to suffer and he taught his disciples about this and yet they struggled to understand. And I get it because if you were following Jesus, what you saw was the most significant, powerful uh, human on the planet doing what only he can do. He was healing the sick. It doesn't, you know, people who were blind were having their sight returned. People who were lame were, were walking. He was feeding 5,000. There was no food and suddenly Jesus breaks bread and blesses it and takes the fish and next thing there's thousands being fed. And then uh, if you're a disciple and you're out in a boat, Jesus comes walking on the water in the middle of a storm. He tells the storm to be quiet and it does. I mean, the environment is under his control. He's casting out demons. There are so many things that he is doing that to think that he would suffer, that, that he was uh, not actually all powerful. He was and yet he was going to show them and us that he could humble himself for a deeper purpose. And in Luke 9, 21, we read, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. They were talking about how he was the Messiah. And then he, he's like, don't tell anyone yet. And then he goes on and he says, the son of man, referring to himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teacher of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Verse 23. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? You see, Jesus is, is talking about so much there and I'm pretty sure for the disciples, their minds maybe couldn't have comprehended all that he was saying and yet the beauty of this passage is written down for us by Luke, who was one of the eyewitnesses to all of this, to help us to understand the story of Jesus and all he would go through. See, this Easter weekend reminds us that Jesus was prepared to suffer 
And then he challenges those who are his followers, those who choose to follow him. We talk about being purpose-filled Jesus followers as a church. That's what we want people to become. That they too, if you're following Jesus, that you too must give up and experience suffering in order to gain the life that Jesus offers. Now, one of the toughest types of suffering is isolation or separation. Uh, you know, if you ever uh, isolated or separated from those you love, it, it's horrible. Maybe you've been on a business trip or you've traveled around the world and, you know, it's wonderful to go to other places and yet your heart longs to be close to the ones you love. Well, COVID that happened not too long ago, causing the pandemic around the world, reminded us of the pain of isolation and separation. We couldn't be with others. We often couldn't be with the ones we loved, even when they were suffering. And it is a real challenge. And Jesus experienced this. In fact, today, loneliness is one of the biggest issues in society. I want to say to you today that Jesus understands loneliness and he understands separation. And the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday tells us this. See, God's heart, though, is that Jesus went through this so there would be a resurrection and a celebration. God's heart is that those who are lonely find a family, find a home. And that's what we believe church is all about. And in Psalm 68, verse 6, God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. How beautiful is that? Whatever your suffering might be, Jesus brings healing and hope. That's the heart of our God. And Jesus went through suffering so that we could be healed, so that we could find hope, and that our lives could find this uh, not alone season, but a home and a family and a place where we are loved and accepted. And that's what Jesus desired for all of us. See, his suffering was for a purpose. And uh, for all of us to understand this, we read through the scripture about what his suffering was, was for. Jesus speaks about his suffering and death when he speaks to Martha. Now, Martha, it seems, was a friend of Jesus, as was Lazarus, her brother, who had just died in the story we're about to read in John chapter 11. And, and Martha is really suffering. She's so upset, as you would be uh, if you've lost uh, your brother who you're really close with. And Jesus has uh, shown up to the tomb where, where Lazarus has been laid and uh, Martha is upset because Jesus has taken time to get there. And in John eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus speaking to her says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Now, Jesus here isn't just speaking about the moment that they are confronted with, that Lazarus has died. But Martha doesn't completely understand what Jesus is saying. He's telling her, that you're suffering for your brother, and I get it, there's pain. In fact, it says in this passage that Jesus wept for Lazarus. Jesus felt the pain. But Jesus was also talking about how he would suffer for Martha and for you and for me, and that he would overcome death and give everyone the opportunity for new life. Now, Martha couldn't fully understand that, but then Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb and he rises again. And Martha thinks that's all there is to it. But Jesus was also prophesying about the fact that he would also overcome the grave. There had to be a suffering in order for there to be a celebration. Can I encourage you today? that if there is pain in your heart, if you are suffering in some way, you can bring it to Jesus because he understands having gone through the suffering. He heals, he restores, he lifts our burdens through the power of his resurrection life. And one of my favorite passages is in Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, "'Come to me, all you who are weary "'and carry heavy burdens.'" and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Jesus offers this to us. Yes, there's suffering, but through the suffering comes the resurrection life and celebration. The second thing I want to remind you of on this Easter weekend is that some things have to die for new life to come. As I get older, I'm learning that this is true more and more. We have seasons in life, uh, seasons and rhythms to our life, and we see that in the way God created the world. We move from one season to the next. I like summer, but we don't have summer all year round where I live. There's a beautiful summer season, but then it gets a bit colder and we head into the autumn months and then into winter and then into spring. Seasons end. Seasons end. Years end. Sometimes relationships end. Jobs end. Kids get older and move out. Family dynamics change and how things were end. But sometimes that's needed in order for something new to begin. And Jesus speaks about this with regard to his own death in John 12, 24. Very truly, I tell you, this is what he says, unless a kernel of wheat or a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus here is saying that death can actually bring more life. Now, death is painful, but sometimes necessary in order to bring about the new thing that God wants to do in our lives. And Jesus uses the example of this in John 15, where he talks about pruning and how things that are going to bear fruit must be cut back in order to bear more fruit. Now, there's a guy, uh, Henry Cloud, who's a psychologist, and he writes about this in his book, Necessary Endings. He says this, pruning is strategic. It is directional and forward-looking. It is intentional towards a vision, desires and objectives that have been clearly defined and are measurable. If you have that, you know what a rose is and pruning will help you get one of true beauty. What's Henry Cloud saying? He's saying, well, if you understand what is going to come out of the the pruning, out of the cutting, out of the death, then you'll accept it because something new and beautiful is coming. And I want to remind you on this Easter weekend that there may be some things that you've had to die to. Jesus died, but out of his death came new life, radical transformation when it comes to our spiritual lives, our relationship with our Heavenly Father, our sins are forgiven. Everything changed because of the death of Jesus and his resurrection. But for you also, maybe there's some things that have died. Well, I believe you can take heart and understand that there are new things that God wants to bring alive in your life. The third thing we understand about this special, significant weekend of Jesus' death and resurrection is that humility leads to freedom. See, the crucifixion of Jesus was Jesus humbling himself for us. I mean, I already shared earlier about how all the disciples had seen was power Jesus. Jesus who's healing. Jesus who's calming storms. Jesus who's casting out demons. Jesus who has an answer for anybody who tries to throw some argument at them. Whatever is going on, Jesus has a way through it. And now he's on the cross. How how could that happen? And we know according to the Word of God, the Bible, that this is God Himself, God in human form. Here is God Himself being killed on a cross. This is humiliation beyond my comprehension, yet God allowed it to happen. Jesus humbled Himself for you and for me, and His humility brought about freedom. See, here's the thing for our lives. Freedom comes from humility. 
Let me say that one more time. Freedom comes from humility. We read about this in Philippians 2 verse 3. It says this, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So here we see our example is Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is good news. I hope wherever you are, you are amening, you are applauding, because that is the reality of what Easter is all about, that Jesus humbled himself. The Almighty God humbled himself so that we could find freedom. See, what does this humility mean? Well, how do we live that out? Well, a big part of humility for us is to accept that we've made mistakes. The Bible talks about how we've sinned. And I think if we're all honest and we all kind of uh, humbled ourselves, we'd all agree we've made mistakes. We're not perfect. But humility goes a step further. Humility is not trying to justify or to blame. It is acknowledging that I've done something wrong or that my life isn't altogether perfect. I'm not altogether perfect. And it's about taking responsibility for my life. See, Jesus humbled himself by accepting the penalty for our sin. He took responsibility not just for his own life. Here's the difference. He took responsibility for my life. He went to the cross for me. He did what I couldn't do for myself. See, in other words, Jesus went down so we could go up. But his way of living challenges all of us not to live in judgment of others, not to live as victims, but to take responsibility for our, our lives and to ask Jesus to forgive us because that's what he does when we come humbly before him. And when that happens, that beautiful moment of salvation where we are saved from our sins. That's what sozo salvation is all about. It means a whole lot of things, but it means that we are set free and saved from the penalty that we deserved. That moment changes us forever. So here's my final thought on this significant, special Easter weekend. Fear and shame are replaced by hope and confidence. Over the Good Friday uh, death of Jesus on the cross, it is all about fear and shame. But on Resurrection Sunday, it is all about hope and confidence. See, when Jesus was crucified, it was in a time of Roman rulership. And the Romans used crucifixion as a way to build fear, to control the masses, to 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 crucify someone, and they, they did it hundreds if not thousands of times, was to show an example that no one else would rise up. No one would rise up against the, the Roman Empire. People would, would live according to the power of Rome, and that was a symbol. It was a, a fear symbol, but it was also a shameful symbol. It was shameful to be crucified. It was a long, public and excruciating way to die. It was the height of shame, up naked on a cross in front of everybody, dying slowly. And here is Jesus, the Son of God, one who showed love and grace and kindness and forgiveness to everyone being publicly shamed and humiliated. 
All those who had followed him, his disciples, must have also felt the shame and humiliation that their their great leader, their, their rabbi teacher, the one who had been so beautiful and gracious and kind to all of them who had, who had loved uh, children and loved the elderly and the young and just, just done so much to, to, to show the love and grace of God was now hanging on a cross, humiliated. And they all scattered. They ran. They didn't know what to do. They felt the shame and humiliation themselves. But here is the good news of Resurrection Sunday morning. On that third day, shame and humiliation were gone. Amen, I hope you're saying. Replaced by hope and confidence as the followers of Jesus became aware that he was risen. Church, I believe some of us have been living under shame and humiliation. Some of us have been living under shame and humiliation about what has happened to us, what we've done, or even just being in our church. Even the name of our church, Hillsong, at times over the last few years may have caused caused us to feel a little bit of shame or humiliation. And that's wrong. You shouldn't live under shame. You shouldn't live under shame because of your past. You shouldn't live under shame because of the church you attend, because you've chosen to follow Jesus and you're part of a group of believers. See, Jesus has taken the shame from you. This church, our church across the globe, is full of people who are just simply sinners saved by grace. People who put up their hand and said, hey, I've made mistakes and I need a saviour. I can't do this life on my own. But with God, I want to step into this new life that Jesus offers and I want to do it in community with others. See, we all need a saviour. It's like I shared right at the top, the beginning, when, uh, when we read, hey, you know, what if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? We all need a saviour. We all need someone to pick us up and say, not shame on you, shame off you. And that's what Jesus said to his disciples. And that's what I want to say to you. We are not going to live under shame and humiliation The enemy would love to put that on you. And and when you get under shame and and feel humiliation, you know what you do? You run and you hide. That's what the disciples did. That's what happened back in Genesis. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. That's not God's plan. You don't have to live under shame and humiliation because it's not about your works. It's not about how good you are. It's all about our Saviour. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what he has done for us, overcoming death and the grave. He gives us hope and confidence through his resurrection life. So let me conclude by reading the prophet Isaiah to you. In Isaiah 61 verse 3, To all who mourn in Zion, he will give beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of despair. For the Lord has planted them like strong and graceful oaks for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities long ago destroyed. They will revive them, though they have been empty for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You'll be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You'll be fed with the treasures of nations and will boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you'll inherit a double portion of prosperity and everlasting joy. And I believe that's what Jesus does for his people. He replaces the shame and the humiliation with hope, with confidence and with joy. I want to encourage you with that on this Easter weekend. There is good news for you. You may have suffered. You may be going through some pain. There may be some things that have died. But just like Jesus, who brings new life through what had died for all of us, there is hope for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. 
for all that he did for us, for the way he went willingly to the cross. He gave up all that was his, the power and all uh, of his, his creation, uh, power and significance to humble himself as a man on the cross. Lord, we ask that you, uh, in the way that only you can, would show us that we also in our suffering are loved by God, that this suffering is not something that is uh, without hope. And Lord, I pray that today we would celebrate that you rose again, Jesus. And Lord, no matter what people are going through, that they would know that theirs can be the resurrection life of hope and confidence. They don't have to live under shame and humiliation. They don't have to live with just the suffering. But Lord God, there is a new day that you have for all of us as we open our hearts and our lives to you, Lord Jesus. And we say thank you and amen, amen. God bless you, church, and a very happy Easter.